So I'm continuing on with the series this evening that we've been doing, finding the, the places in the Bible that talk about taking heed. And um, I'm not going to re- even recap all the, the previous weeks that we've done. We've, ta- we've uh, covered most of the areas that take heed is used a lot of times about the same subject, you know, with idolatry or obeying God's commandments, things like that. But this passage, what I'm going to do tonight is we're, uh, I'm definitely going to be teaching on this, this subject here, but before I even really dig into kind of the meat of um, where I'm going with, with this take heed, I, I really want to kind of devote a little bit of time to Hebrews chapter 3 as a whole. It's one of the more uh, difficult passages, you know, for, like, it could cause problems for a lot of people, and, and understandably so, you know, so, w- some of the way that things are worded here. It's really not complicated at all. But sometimes it throws people for a loop and kind of gets you start to questioning things. And one of the reasons why I, why I picked this one, if you know, look, just look at verse number 12 real quick. The Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So the take heed, of course, for tonight is unbelief, an evil heart of unbelief, right? So there's lots of ways we could have unbelief, and I'm going to get into all that. But like I said, before I really dig into having you know, unbelief here. No, because notice it says, take heed brethren, right? This is being addressed. Um, and, and, you know, and I went through this. I was studying this out. And I was looking through the book of Hebrews. Even though it's a book to the Hebrews, right? It's, it's you know, there's, the epistles of Paul is written to the people at the, at the church at Rome, the people at the church at Corinth, you know, different places. They're typically being sent to different churches. This is a little bit more general to the Hebrews, people who are children of Abraham physically. But I don't, th- this book doesn't appear to be written in, the, you know, it goes back and forth a little bit, but for the most part, it's written for people who are already believers, right? It's, it's, he's talking to people, yes, they're of the physical seed, but he's giving a little bit more information to people who have already been practicing their faith under the Old Testament rules and Old Testament laws, you know, with the sacrifices and things. So Hebrews, he, in the whole book, he kind of, he draws a lot of parallels with Jesus Christ, you know, and makes salvation very clear. But he also then explains, you know, the blood of bulls and goats and, you know, they could never offer salvation, all this other stuff. And the things that have kind of changed as you go forward into the New Testament. So it's, it's a very useful and needful book, but to the Gentiles who never really practiced the, you know, if you want to call it Judaism or whatever, you want to practice religion of the Old Testament, it's not quite as important because they weren't doing that already, whereas the Hebrews were. They were, they were doing more of these practices, so he's, he's doing that. But when he said, and so all of that said, just to mean that I don't think when he says brethren, it's like he's just referring to physical people who are unsaved. I still think his audience is a saved audience. Now, I'm going to reread some of this and kind of do a little bit of expository before I get into the main part of the message, just because I do think it's important. And and basically in this chapter, what he's doing is he brings up the story of Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. And the main point, the primary um, teaching that we get from Hebrews 3 is definitely in regards to salvation. Because he brings up the point that you know, God was upset with people, with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Sarah, sit up in your chair right now. That they were sinning. They didn't believe him. They were, you know, they were, they were going after other gods. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to, and they didn't go to, um, they didn't believe basically that God was going to bring them into the promised land. If you remember the story specifically, they sent out the spies to spy out the land, right? It's now 12 spies and 10 of them came back with an evil report and two of them had a good report, Right? And when they saw the land, they, they all said, <coughs> excuse me, they all said, yeah, the land is great. You know, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. They brought back some of the fruit of the land. They said, but the people of the land, you know, there's giants in the land. There are people of great stature. It's real tall, real big. And they were perceived to be this enemy that was just, they could not defeat them. So they were real, just ready to go back to Egypt, basically, because like, oh, yeah, there's no way we could do this. So they didn't have faith 
that what God said, when God said he was going to deliver them in their hand, and God said he was going to fight the battle for them, when God said that he was going to do everything and, and they were going to inherit the land, they didn't believe it. And what we see here in Hebrews chapter 3, it's drawing the parallel. Hey, they didn't enter into the promised land. They didn't get to that place because of their unbelief. That's what prevented them from making it into the promised land. So they were forced to wander around the wilderness until they all died off, right? Which draws the parallel to we can't enter into the promised land. We can't go to heaven until we believe, right? People who don't make it to heaven, it's because of their unbelief. So it's a very, very simple, and this is the primary teaching that we see here in Hebrews 3. And I'm going to cover a couple of the more difficult verses that people have a problem with and explain what I believe about them. But um, I'm going to be kind of taking this in a direction that, that I think is completely applicable as well within this chapter and within Hebrews but it's not the primary surface meaning of it. So many times in the Bible, you're going to see areas where you always have a primary meaning to what you're reading in Scripture, but then you also can make applications and gain some more truth and, and some knowledge that you're not just, you know, pulling at straws. You're actually, it's literally legitimately there, but it's not the, the surface intended meaning. It's a deeper meaning. And the deeper meaning is kind of more what I'm going to be focusing on. So, um, and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense as I get into this a little bit. But um, let's start reading here in verse number one. I'm going to exposit some of these verses. It's a short chapter. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. So again, this is, this is good reason to believe that he's talking to people who are saved, right? He calls them holy brethren, not just brethren. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our prof profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And this is one of those verses that people have a hard time with or problem with, and they think that maybe there's some contradiction here or, you know, well, wait a minute, I thought once you believe you're saved and that's it forever, right? And we have people sometimes ask the question, because we believe eternal life is eternal. We believe that you only have to be born again one time, and once you're saved, you're saved forever, okay? But what this is saying is actually, and what I, what I believe personally, so when people ask the question, theoretically, what if someone were to stop believing, right? Well, theoretically, they're still saved. I mean, and that's not even, th that, that's no doubt about it. They're, they're definitely still saved. And one of the places that I like to show people is in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we can look at that real quick. Just a few pages backwards. If you want to hold your place there in Hebrews 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not... Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And this is, always, this is a great answer to people who say, well, wait, you know, what if, what if a person were to stop believing? Well, even if a person were to stop believing, God cannot deny himself. He cannot go back on his word. Once he's made the promise and said, whosoever believeth in me you know, shall never die, right? Believest thou this, or you have eternal life, or you have everlasting life. Those are promises, and those are promises that God doesn't go back on his word on, so you have them. So God remains faithful to what he said, even if you become unfaithful with your belief on him, okay? So that answers that, that settles that, it makes perfect sense, and we even have scripture that can say, well, that is what would happen, but it's still a hypothetical of just saying what if someone believes and then completely stops believing? And the answer that I have to that is that I don't 
I don't think that that's even possible. I don't. So, which matches up perfectly with what the scripture is saying here because it's not saying you have to do any works. It's just saying you're holding that belief, that, that hope for the rest of your life. You're, you're, you're believing for the rest of your life. And once a person's born again, you know, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We, we have that within us. And it's almost, you know, like it almost doesn't even make sense. Like once some, if someone has truly believed on Christ and got saved, it's, it, it's almost hard to even come up with a scenario as to why someone would just not believe in God at all after you've already been saved. I'm not saying it, well, I don't think it ever happens. That's my, that's my position on that. I don't think that it does happen. And when I read verses like this, I think that just more confirms that he's saying, because there's a few other verses that are very similar to this, um, where he's saying, you know, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Let's keep reading because there's another verse in here that's very similar. Verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed. Now, and this is where we come up to where, um, you know, the, the subject matter for the sermon is tonight. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, you find oftentimes in these letters and the letters to churches and stuff, while he, yes, he's preaching to believers and letters, and it's still sent to kind of a multitude of people, okay? And in multiple epistles, the Apostle Paul is kind of calling out and even questioning people's salvation at these various churches and basically telling you, hey, take heed to yourself. You know, basically what I believe he's saying here is just, you know, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You know, check your own salvation. Watch out for yourself. Make sure that, that you do have that belief, that it is that you did have the saving faith, that you did put your faith in Jesus Christ, that you do know that you're saved. And watch out for this evil heart of unbelief because what happens is that sin can creep in and harden people's hearts to the gospel. I mean, that happens with unsaved people, I think, regularly where they just get so entrenched in their sin and they've just become so hardened that they're just hardened to the gospel and they end up never getting saved. And when the Apostle Paul is writing these things, yet yeah, generally speaking, he's writing to believers, but you always have to, you know, when I preach a sermon, some, you know, I'm preaching to believers but I still can oftentimes throw out something that's basically, hey, check your own salvation, right? I mean, you need to know this for yourself because at the end of the day, I don't know. I mean, for all I know, I might be preaching to an unbeliever that I think is saved. And it's, it's fine to have this come out. Just an example, Galatians is a perfect example of the Apostle Paul writing in this type of a manner. Okay, in Galatians 1, he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he's talking to people who, who basically are just, you know, starting to believe some other gospel altogether, different from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, which is not another, but there is some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And there's people out there that are, that are perverting, twisting, changing the gospel, and I'm shocked to even hear that you've already been removed into believing something else. And then he makes very, very clear how serious this is by saying, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a curse. Basically saying, don't allow these people to get into your head. Don't allow them the time of day. Don't have anything to do with them. Let them be accursed. Because that is very, very serious and you shouldn't be, you know, shaken that much to just be removed from the gospel unto some other false gospel. And then he repeats it again, as we said before, so say it now again. 
If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently sent forth, crucified among you. And then in chapter 4, because he's going on and on and explain and just really going into detail. Galatians is a great book for salvation, by the way, because he's really going into detail about it not being by circumcision, being by faith, not the works of the law, and all these things. As you read Galatians 1, 2, and 3, and then you get to chapter 4, and he says in verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And he's, call, he's calling their salvation into doubt with that statement. And for good reason. Because if you have people that are just being removed to another gospel right after they had the, the right gospel, he's saying, have I just been working and, and, and doing all this stuff in vain? Because it is in vain if they're just not saved. If they're just a bunch of unbelievers, then it, it's been in vain. So this isn't like the first time we would see something like this in scripture where he's admonishing or giving warning and telling people, hey, check, you know, check your own salvation because I'm already doubtful of you. First Corinthians 15, very similar um, to what we find here. First Corinthians 15, one says, moreover, brethren, and if you know the gospel, we, oftentimes we turn to first Corinthians 15 to, to give people the gospel because it talks about the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in verse number one, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Very similar wording to what we saw in Hebrews chapter 3, when he said, um, Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Right? It's a similar concept. But what we see here, he says, Unless ye have believed in vain. Now, what I think he's saying here when he says you believed in vain is just that you didn't believe right. You didn't actually get saved. I mean, there's a lot of people who claim the name of Christ that aren't actually saved. They were never saved to begin with, but they go through long periods of their life going to church, going through the motions, doing things. But, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they just didn't fully understand the gospel. Maybe they didn't believe in eternal security, but this whole time they're kind of thinking they're saved and they're really not. And then later on, maybe years later or whatever, they're um, giving up on God or they're changing religions or they're going, you know, whatever. And they didn't keep that hope because they didn't even really have it to begin with. Does that make sense? So, getting back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to him that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And again, and then when you start reading through chapter 4, it's, it, it seems very clear to me. Chapter 3 is talking a lot about salvation. It's talking about being saved. That's the primary application and understanding. And the primary is just, it's belief. So keeping your belief unto the end is not works. Because your belief is still a belief. It has nothing to do with adding works of salvation whatsoever. But you're ma you maintain that belief. That belief stays with you. I mean, it makes sense. You have other verses as well that talk about like, um, you know, my sheep hear my voice and another they will not follow. Right? Jesus was saying that. that, that and what is that saying? That if you're a sheep, if you're a believer on Christ, that a false prophet 
isn't going to lead you astray. You're not just gonna you're not just gonna jump ship from being like a believer in Christ to just believe in like like just become a Catholic, right? We just join the Roman Catholic Church and just completely do something else and just follow some other shepherd. You see what I'm saying? And, and and that's what he's teaching there. So if someone is say in an independent fundamental Baptist church and then they just completely jump ship and just go somewhere else, I would say they were never saved to begin with. Because if you're being deceived by, by some, other, some other shepherd, then you didn't have Jesus to begin with. It's just like in Matthew 24 where it says there's going to be false Christs and false prophets that are going to arise and they're going to deceive many. And that's what's going to be tricking people into taking the mark of the beast. Well, we know that believers are not going to take the mark of the beast because it, he says these are going to show, show so many lying signs and wonders that if it were possible, he'd deceive the very elect, meaning that it's not possible. So there are certain things that are impossible. It's impossible for a believer to lose his salvation. It's impossible for a believer to take the mark of the beast because then they'd be going to hell. They have eternal life. It's impossible for, for a believer in Matthew 24. The reason why they're not going to take the mark of the beast is because they're not going to be deceived by the false prophet. They're not going to be deceived by Antichrist. Why? Because they have the spirit of God dwelling in them. Because they have that new creature, as I was explaining this morning, that's born again inside of you that just will not let you be deceived. You will have that sense of knowledge or of knowing who Christ is. Because you're saved, because you're part of his family, because you're born again, you hear his voice. So this isn't really a problem for me. You know, it, people bring up the, the question, well, what if I stop believing? But I think it's a question that just can't happen anyways. Just as much as it's impossible to be deceived by, a, by the false prophet, by the, by the Antichrist. Because the Bible says that that's impossible. Just as much as I believe that it's impossible for someone who's born again to tamper with and corrupt and just put out some false version of the Bible. Again, because that would be something that would damn them to hell. But if they have everlasting life, they can't be damned to hell. So that's the, 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 the Hebrews 3 you know, where he's, in, and especially in verse 12, where, I, where the reason why I think he has this in there is saying basically to take heed, hey, check yourself, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, right? But there's a secondary meaning to this, and I'm going to be teaching more and going into a lot of other examples and other parts of the Bible on the secondary application of this, because if you remember, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In that same story, of Moses and the children of Israel and, you know, going into the promised land, we have this, this account in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, passing through the sea when they came out of Egypt, right? When the, when the wall, the, the, the sea was, became walls around them, they went through the sea. And then it says, and they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So that was, that, that was representative or a picture of baptism when they went through that sea. They had the water, you know, all around them. They went through, he's saying, they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. He's talking about all the children of Israel. And it says, and they did all eat the same spiritual meat, they ate manna, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So they're saying they all drank of that rock, and that rock was Christ. Basically saying they all received Christ. Okay, This is a different picture that we're getting about the children of Israel. See, it used their unbelief to demonstrate or paint a picture of salvation, of it while they didn't go into the promised land. But let me ask you this. Do you really think that None of those people were saved that didn't enter into the promised land. Now, he's using their not believing God to fight their battles for them as an illustration of someone who doesn't believe on the Lord to be saved and go to heaven. Okay, but I don't believe that they were all completely not saved but they were in sin, in the sin of unbelief. And this is what we need to take heed to today, even as a believer, even as someone who's born again 
and is saved, there are many, many areas of our life where we can have an evil heart of unbelief, where we're not believing God, where we don't quite have the faith to trust in God's word in our day-to-day -day life, in the things that we do. We can see the Bible says one thing, but we're doubtful of that. We're not acting on what the Bible says. We're doing things that are different because at the end of the day, what we're really saying, whether you want to admit it or not, is that you're not believing God. Just like it says in 1 John chapter 5, right, that, that um, we're basically, if you don't believe the record that God has given of his son, you're making him a liar, right? And we use this example when we go out soul winning, at least I do, I use this example if I were to say, well, hey, what if I were to tell you that I have a white van? Do you believe me? You could either say yes or no. Yes, if you believe me, then you believe that I'm telling you the truth. You trust me that, that the, the words that I'm saying, that I actually own a vehicle that's white and it's a van. And if you say no, then what you're saying is that I'm lying. That when I tell you I have a white van, I'm lying to you. And there's no other way around it. Oh, no, no, I'm not calling you. You, know, you can say, oh, no, I'm not calling you a liar. But if you say you don't believe me, then that is what you're doing. And when we could read God's word and we can see, for example, if he says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you in reference to having food and clothing. And if we could see that and we could read that and you could say you believe that. But if you're not practicing that and you forsake the things of God because you say, well, I need to have food and clothing. Do you see where I'm going with this? Then you don't believe the word of God. You don't believe what God is saying there because you just aren't trusting. You're not willing to trust that what God said is true. And you are taking matters into your own hands. This is the evil heart of unbelief that we need to be watching out for. This is what I believe is the secondary application in Hebrews chapter 3, because primarily it's talking about salvation, but you're saved today. You have that faith, that saving faith, and you're going to hold that fast unto the end because you're born again, because you're not going to be deceived by some false prophet. You're saved. But we still need to take heed and beware and be careful that the things that we do, that the way that we live our life, is in, is in accordance with God's word and that we are really believing what this says and not having unbelief. And in 1 Corinthians 10 there, it says, you know, they, they, that rock was Christ. So basically it's saying that they were all, in a sense, saved, right? Now, again, this is an abstract thing. This, it, it's, it's, it's teaching another concept here. I also don't believe that every single person that came out of there was spiritually saved either. I think it's like any group of people. You had some that were saved and some that were not saved. Okay? But when it's trying to make a point and when it's using symbolism and symbolic references like, oh, they were all baptized, they all drank of that spiritual drink and that, you know, that rock was Christ and you know, all these things, it's because it's teaching another point. And the point it's teaching here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5, which I believe can also be applied in Hebrews 3, uh, verse number 5 says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Even though, yeah, they were baptized, they, they drank of Christ, they received, you know, even though they had all these things, you could say they were saved. God was still angry with them, and he let them die in the wilderness. And this is what we need to take heed to. Because even though you're saved, God can still get angry with you when you just don't believe him, when he's telling you what to do, you don't believe it, you have a wicked heart of unbelief over whatever portion of God's word you're not having faith in. And you can get judged for that. And I'm not talking about eternal judgment for your soul. We're just talking about in this lifetime, like they did physically. Physically, they didn't enter into the, the promised land. That was a judgment because they weren't believing that God were, was going to fight their battle for them. They got scared at the enemy. But getting scared of a physical battle does not mean that you're not saved. But in this case, it did mean they weren't believing God. So the application is, hey, you don't believe God, you don't make it into the promised land. That is applying it to our salvation. 
but you can also apply it to, hey, if you're a believer and you are saved, God can still be angry with you and judge you. So do you see how there's two meanings to this, to this story and can be presented in two different ways? And even in Hebrews 3, when he's saying, hey, brethren, lest there be any evil heart of you of unbelief in departing from the living God, it's still something, even though the primary application, what he's talking about is salvation, there's also the secondary application that we take away from this is saying, hey, we still need to make sure that we are believing every word of God. Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. That's what we live by. And we need to make sure we're doing that. So um, I already covered this in 2 Timothy 2. You know, what if someone is saved and they stop believing in Jesus? I don't think it's possible, but that still doesn't negate eternal life. Um, turn, if you would, to... Matthew 17, I want to give you some examples here of saved people that had unbelief because, again, I think this will help to drive it home a little bit of what, of what we're talking about and, and taking heed of, of unbelief. Say, well, I believe Jesus, right? I know you believe in Jesus. I know he's your Savior. But let's look at some other examples where people, where we have examples of born-again people who still are being, um, it's mentioned here that they didn't believe. Okay, some, something else, some other aspect of God's word. Matthew 17, look at verse number 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless, and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples of Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? So there's a man, his son was possessed with a devil. And it was very serious. He's lunatic, he's sore vexed, you know, there's, there's, he's being cast into the water and the fire, all these problems. And I brought him to your disciples, and your disciples weren't able to cast out the devil. And here they were because they were out there casting out devils with other people, right? They were going out, they were healing people, they were doing all these things that Jesus told them to do. But when this case came to him, he said they weren't able to do it. And this was a tough case because Jesus even said, well, this, this type goeth not forth but by prayer and fasting, right? But what was Jesus' answer though? Look at verse number, because the disciples asked him, well, why couldn't we do this, right? I mean, we've had this power over devils of... Verse 20, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Now, other than Judas, the disciples believed on Jesus. They were saved people. This isn't just talking about Judas here. But he says, because of your unbelief, for verily I said unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And what he's saying is, you didn't believe that. Now we look at that and say, well, that could be hard to believe. Yeah, but if God says it, then it's true. He says, if you just have that much faith, then you can do these things and you have to, you know, if you don't believe it, that's on you, but you're the reason, then it's your unbelief that this isn't happening. And here we have one example. Turn if you go to John 20. That's one example of a, of a saved person that Jesus said was, had unbelief, that did not believe in God's word. That doesn't make them unsaved. But it is an area we need to be careful about because we don't want to be falling into this habit of just not believing God's word. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. John chapter 20, verse number 24. Very famous example of someone who is saved. Not believing and not believing something very important. Uh, Thomas. Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Sarah, sit up. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Go sit back there by your mother. The other disciples therefore said unto him, verse 25, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's a strong statement coming from someone who is saved. He's saying, I won't, I won't believe it. You're all telling me this stuff and I won't believe it until I can see it, put my fingers in his hand. 
uh, verse 26, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto my Lord and my God, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas needed to see that in order to believe. He said, I'm not even going to believe. Yet, Jesus himself told his disciples, and we have record of that, saying that he was going to be raised again after three days. Now, we know they didn't understand that, but they were told that. And he didn't believe that until now, until he was able to just see it and it was proven to him. He believed that. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. Again, a very similar. It has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark 16, verse number 9. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had seen of her, believed not. So again, we have people who are not believing what was happening here, what was prophesied. Verse number 12, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. So this is Jesus appearing unto the, who's the eleven he's talking about? The eleven apostles, eleven disciples, right? Eleven because Judas already killed himself. Judas isn't one of the twelve at this point, so he, he appeared unto the eleven. Who was it that didn't believe the reports of Mary Magdalene and the others? The eleven. According to verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven at this, as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Remember what the passage was in Hebrews 3 that we need to take heed for? Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And he said he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Again, I'm, I'm just showing you this. These are examples of people who we know were saved. I mean, they were his disciples, the eleven. They believed on Jesus Christ as their Savior. They knew he was a Savior. Peter said, you know, you're the Christ. They trusted in him, but they didn't believe this part, and they didn't understand it, and they didn't believe it. And Jesus abraded them, you know, he was angry with them that they didn't believe, but it didn't make them unsaved. So let's look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is another example. This is the last example of a person in the Bible that we're going to look at, or people at the Bible who we know were saved but had unbelief. Look at verse number 11 of Luke chapter 1. The Bible reads, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right hand of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So this is John the Baptist's father. Zacharias, he's a priest, he's in the temple, he's performing his job. Angel appears unto him and he says, hey, we know, I know you've been praying to have a child. Your wife Elizabeth's going to have a son and you're going to call his name John. Verse 14, and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. So that question there, how do I know that? How do I really know this is going to happen? And when you ask somebody that, what does that mean? You don't believe them, right? 
how do I know that that's really going to happen? He's asking because he didn't believe the words that the angel was speaking to him. He's like, and, and he gives a reason. I'm an old man and so is my wife. How is it that we're going to have a child? Because he didn't believe him. And because he didn't believe, look at verse number 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. So again, it was this unbelief. And you know, you could look at these, these various situations and, be, and you could understand maybe how they didn't believe. But understanding it doesn't mean that you should still have that heart of unbelief. Right? Understanding how it can happen doesn't mean that we should be, uh, you know, have any unbelief in our heart for any of the words of God or any mess. You know, I mean, you could look at this story and be like, well, it's clear to him it was an angel speaking to him. So if an angel is speaking to him from God, you know, it's, it's true. You know, and he was prophesying, and he knew his prayers, and he knew, you know, whatever. So, and I'm not going to get all into that, but um, in any case, anytime you know God's word, no matter where it is, you have instruction, you have what God's told us to do, it's much easier to believe it Right? You read your Bible, you see the instructions, you believe it. It's a lot easier to just accept that and believe it until something happens that will challenge your belief. That's when things get real. Right? That's when your faith is demonstrated. That's when it's tested or tried what you really believe. So when we ask people about their salvation, what do we do? We, te we, we test their belief by coming up with scenarios or examples of saying, is this person saved, right? You start off just by asking, well, what do you have to do to be saved? And say, believe in Jesus. You can test whether or not they really believe that by, by giving some extreme example, like we often do, of someone who believed in Jesus, but then they commit this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin, are they going to heaven or hell, right? That helps get to the heart of the matter because now you're proving, you're testing, do you really believe that? Do you really believe it's grace? Do you really believe it's not works? If they start saying you got to obey the law to some degree, then you know that they don't believe it's not of works. You know that because you've tried it now, you've tested it. Well, the Bible tells, here, here's an example of something that came to my mind while I was thinking about this. You know, the Bible get, is very clear on how we are to discipline our children. Is it not? The book of Proverbs is very clear on the proper discipline of children. But let's say you read some book. You read a parenting book. Some psychologist says, you know, spankings actually do damage. Actually, you're really messing with your child. It's not good for them. And you shouldn't spank your children. And you hear it from your family and you hear it from other people, right? And you say, you know what? Maybe they're right. I'm not going to spank my children. Now, at that point, you probably wouldn't say, I don't believe God's word. You said, oh, of course I believe the Bible, right? Because, I mean, it's very rare where someone's actually going to come out and say, yeah, I don't believe the Bible. But in your actions and in your heart, what you're doing is saying, I don't believe the Bible. Because when you have verses, like Proverbs 19, 18, chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. You say, yeah, well, chasten, it's just disciplining, you know, uh, yeah, I know they cry and I should still make sure they're punished, but that's not necessarily talking about spankings. Okay. Well, Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringing his mother to shame. And people want to take that verse and say, Yeah, but the rod, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a rod to actually hit them with. It's a rod to guide them with. Right? This is, this is, these are some excuses that people want to make for God's word. So you say, Okay, so chasing thy son, yeah, you see, that's not talking about giving him a spanking. The rod of reproof give wisdom. It's a little bit stronger language. You say, but, but nope, it's not a rod of reproof. Okay, then Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, 12 says, Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt 
beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. What do we do with that? It's clear. It gives you instruction. And notice, it doesn't say beat him with your hand. Just beat him with the rod. And I'm not going to give a whole lesson on spankings this evening, but it's very, it's very simple because when you use your hand, it's a lot easier to cause more blunt force trauma to, and actually injure a child by using your hand if you're, if, if you're, not, if you're definitely not careful with it. Like you, you're, you're causing a lot more force from, from your hand as opposed to using the rod as an intermediate to give that sharp sting on the skin but does not injure or cause any like real damage to the child. It just stings and, and, and helps them to experience that pain to not want to do that again. Whereas when you're using your hand, you could get, I mean, it's a lot easier to get bones out of place and other things because you're using that. It's not, it's not as uh, precise as using the instrument. But God's word has that for us. The instruction is there and it's very clear. But when we decide, oh no, I know more, I know better, or my child doesn't respond to that, they respond to something else, and you're not just following God's word, then, you're, then you're, you have an evil heart of unbelief in God's word. You're not giving the proper authority, number one, to God's word, of saying, this is the Bible, this is God's word, this is scripture. Who am I to say that I know more than God does about child rearing? Or any subject, for that matter. How about drinking booze? You see in Proverbs, again, Proverbs 23, you can read the end of the chapter. It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Those things happen when you get drunk. You don't have to try it for yourself. You don't have to test God. You, don't have to, you, know, you just have to believe it. When the Bible says not to look on the wine when it's red, when it giveth this color, color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, just believe it and obey. And don't think, well, that's not, you know, I can look at it, it's fine for me, or whatever. Because now you have a wicked heart of unbelief. You're not just believing what God's word says. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the sermon, you know, God's promise to feed and clothe you if you seek first the kingdom of God. And if you're doing those things, but then you're still worried about being fed and clothed, you're not believing you, what God said. And that makes God angry. And when the children of Israel didn't believe God, God got very angry and he punished them. And they weren't allowed. They didn't receive the blessings. They didn't, receive the, they didn't go into the promised land. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 78. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Psalm 78. We'll be, we're going to close on this chapter. Because this gives us just a, a great um, summary or history of the children of Israel not believing God and then suffering as a result. So we're going to see just a, bu a, bu excuse me, a bunch of examples here laid out. And we're going to read, oh, probably not the whole psalm. There's 72 verses in it, but we'll, we'll start going through this until I feel the, the point's made pretty clear. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a gener generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. So we're going to, the intro part here is saying, hey, 
you know, God's given them the law and it's supposed to be they need to teach this to their children and then to their children's children so that they don't have these wicked hearts that their fathers had before them. That they're not stubborn, that they're not rebellious, that they can actually just believe God's word. And now he's going to start, we already started getting into this a little bit, people who they received the law and they didn't believe. And they, and they weren't believing in, in, in the things that they suffered. Verse number 10, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things that he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and he made the waters to stand as in heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? There's their evil heart of unbelief. God's leading them out. He was able to make the water stand up on either side. He was able to lead them by a cloud in the day and a fire by night. He was able to keep them separated from the, from the Egyptians who were going after them. He was able to do all this stuff, but they're saying, well, can God make us a, a table in the wilderness? when they were lusting after flesh. Again, that evil heart of unbelief, and you'll see that over and over. I'm not going to stop at every point, but you're going to see this over and over and over again. Every time they had this wicked heart of unbelief, and every time, God, of course God's able to do that because nothing is too hard for the Lord. But it's your unbelief that's limiting God. It's your stinking rebellious heart an unbelieving heart that's not trusting that God will provide for you, that he can take care of you. And even coming down to giving you your lust to your heart, God can do it. Verse 20, Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was wroth. See, it makes God angry. When you start questioning God, can God do this? Can God do that? Oh, we're out here. God's going to kill us. What does he do? You know, it makes God angry. This evil heart of unbelief in his word that he's going to take care of you makes him angry. And this is what we need to be taking heed to. That we don't make God angry through our actions and through our hearts of just not believing in God's word when it, when it tells us very explicitly what we are to do. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger came, also came up against Israel. Verse 22, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea and he let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their habitation so they did eat and were well filled for he gave them their own desire they were not estranged from their lust but while their meat was yet in their mouths the wrath of god came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of israel So not only were they questioning God, God punished them, but in his punishment, he still showed them, yes, I can do these things. Don't you question me. And then sent the, the plague and said, here you go, eat up. And I love what it says in, in um, oh, I forget if it's Deuteronomy or Numbers when it says that basically that they're, the, the food's going to be coming out of their nostrils, right? He's, he's like, I, you're going to eat until you're sick of it, and it's just going to be coming out of your nostrils like you're just, I'm just going to give you so much. So I'll, I'll give you your stinking flesh to eat. Uh, it's, a, it's just an attitude because God's so angry with them. Why? Because they didn't believe that he was taking care of them. They didn't believe him. They didn't trust in the Lord. Verse 32, for all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and iniquity, excuse me, and inquired early after God. 
And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over the pestilence and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them safely so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to, the, to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them in inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. And then it goes on and on and on about his wrath and his anger against them. And it's a familiar story, but look, we need to be taking heed. We need, and these people, I mean, they saw all that God was capable of doing, all of God's anger, all of God's wrath, the locusts, the catapult, you know, the pestilence, everything that it mentioned there. like they knew about all this stuff, yet they still turned their back from me. It's like they didn't believe that God would do it to them because they were God's people. Well, guess what? You're God's people. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Take heed because God's the same God. Yes, He's long-suffering and merciful, but let's not tempt the Lord our God Let's not test him. We've seen what he's done with his people in the past. Let's believe his words. Let's not get some evil heart of unbelief and, and not believing the scripture and, and just being able to trust what it says. Let, let's, let's trust all of it. Trust the parts that, that you don't like. Trust them to be true. Hey, trust, trust that God has the wisdom. You know, I wish, I wish our government would trust the Bible and trust God's word when it comes to the appropriate punishments that ought to be meted out for, for criminals, for crimes that are done. I, would to God that that could happen if people could just have the faith and trust of knowing that that's the right way to do things. It is the right way because it's God's word. But when people say, oh, no, no, that's too harsh. Oh, no, no, a pedophile shouldn't be put to death. They just need to get a slap on the wrist and get a few years in prison. We could rehabilitate them. Yeah, man's wisdom always fails. Always. Let's say, and, and you know what? That makes God angry. And especially in that case, you know what makes God angry? Because those predators get back out on the street and they defile more children. And God's like, I told you, they ought to just be put to death. And now you got a problem. More children are being defiled. More innocent blood's being shed. More innocent lives are being destroyed because you didn't believe me. And you're not carrying out what I told you to do. You can apply this in every way as far as every word of God. Let's believe it all. Let's believe the parts that, that you, don't, you like and you don't like. Hopefully you like it all. 
Praise God. It's the word of the Lord. What do I know better than God does? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your clear instruction. God, I pray that you would please help our hearts to be softened and not, not hardened through the deceitfulness of, of sin and riches and, and the things of this world. Lord, help us not to get caught up into those things, that we would have some evil heart of unbelief, Lord, but that we can just uh, stay humble and lowly in our own eyes and that we can look to you for all of our answers and for all truth and knowledge, dear Lord. Help us to understand right from wrong. Help us to just um, accept your words for what they say and not try to change them and not be swayed by what, what this world is going to try to tell us that your words mean, but that we can just accept your words for what they mean. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.